awesome time of worship this morning. I hope you've been blessed by that. I hope you've offered up some praise to the Lord today and the songs. Music was awesome. Thank you, worship team, for that. It was a blessing to me. Genesis chapter 50 is where we're going to look for a few minutes in Genesis chapter 50. And I kind of opened up an idea last week, a phrase, a thought, and it was this. It was, a, so what, now what? I said that several times. So what, now what? I want to think about that again today in this place in Joseph's life. We talked about last week, we we're going to look at Joseph a little bit. And I actually kind of start out here at the end of his life. There's something important for us to know. It goes with every song we just sing about the goodness of God and God running after us and about him being with us and us never having to be alone and knowing that and understanding that. We were singing that song and I was just reminded of a picture I have in my office at home. And it's just a little portrait I bought a long, long time ago. And it's a picture of a bucket hanging on an old whale where you pump the whale in the little caption read, said, Lord, Lord, I crawled across the barrenness, even afraid to even ask for one drop of refreshment. If I would have only known you better, I would have come running with my bucket. We, we Sometimes we just need to know that place to run into where God is for us. And not try to run from him so much, but to run into him. In Genesis chapter 50, I'm going to read about uh, verses 15 through 26. The very last words here in the book of Genesis. And we're going to hear about some things from Joseph's life. And we're going to talk about Joseph a little bit. And kind of with that thought for him, so what? Now what do you do with it? Now I want you to think about that for life for every one of us. Because we all have somewhere right now, every one of us is living in some kind of situation. This kind of, so what? We, we have stuff we deal with, stuff that's hard. Things that come into our life, comes into our world that is difficult. And what God keeps saying to me, okay, now what? Now what do you plan to do with where you are? And Joseph has a lot of those in his life. He has a lot of things he has to deal with in his life. It seems like an overabundant supply of circumstances. And we think about circumstances, and here's where I get with some of this, is so often we want to judge God by our circumstances. Rather than through eyes of faith, let that be the judge of the circumstances. And that happens a lot for us because we get, the world kind of caves in and we start saying, where's God? What's going on? Where, what's happening here, God? Where, because this is not working out quite like I thought. And it's kind of one of those, uh, so what kind of moments? What are you going to do with that now? Where are you going to be? Joseph understands that. Joseph lived that his whole life. And I'm going to tell you something. Joseph's life, didn't quite turn out like he thought he had planned it to. Just didn't quite go. But he understands something in this whole thing. And you're going to hear this phrase, God meant it for good. God meant it for good. Let's just listen a minute. Genesis 50, 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sins, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for me, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid, I will Provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, the sons of Machar, the sons of Manasseh, and were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you. And bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. 
Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years and was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Father, we thank you for your word that we can read today. Lord, for your presence, we feel and know in this place where when we come together as Solitude Baptist Church and we assemble together in this room and as we sing praise and we sing honor and we sing glory to you, God, your presence is known greatly and we thank you. God, we lean into you today and we ask God you speak to us. Open our hearts, our minds, our worlds, God, so that each one of us as we live through this day and and we face the challenges that today has, God, may we look and see and know you first and foremost. You're above everything. You're in everything. You're over everything. And and God, you're going to bring about, as Joseph said here, God, you're going to bring about that which is good. I believe that through every circumstance, through every trial, uh, through every difficulty we face, God, that's who you are. So may we glorify you. May we bring glory to you in everything we do. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the last uh, several weeks, Karen and I have finished reading a book that Rod Bryant had recommended to me some time back uh, by Max Locato. It's a new work he's done. And the title of that book is simply this, You'll Get Through This. You'll Get Through This. And all through the book, he's kind of helping you uh, framework. And he uses a lot of stories from the life of Joseph to do that framework. And there's a story that he shares in there. And I want to read part of that to you because I want you to see and I want you to feel this lady's heart, just where she was in this moment of time and then we're going to move into Joseph's story and look a little bit about him. Her name is Kristen Taylor and here's what he wrote. He said, here's from her journal and here's what he just put right into the book from her journal. Multiple hospital stays with my daughter were exhausting but I held faith. Losing Brian, my husband's family members, one by one until only one was left who was then diagnosed with stage four brain cancer was incomprehensible but I held faith. Being hospitalized seven and a half weeks with placental disruption, abruption, was terrifying, but I held the faith. I held to a faith that God works for my good, and I thought I did uh, not necessarily understand all the trials, but I trusted God's bigger, unseen plan. God and I had a deal. I would endure the trials that came my way as long as He acknowledged my breaking point. He knew where the line was drawn. I knew in my heart he would never cross it. He did. I delivered a stillborn baby girl. With my daughter Rebecca still at home on a feeding tube and her future health completely unknown, it was a foregone conclusion that this baby we so wanted and loved would be saved. She wasn't. The line in the sand was crossed. One My one-way deal with God was shattered. Everything changed in that moment. Fear set in. My faith began to crumble. And my safety zone with God was no longer safe. Here's what he shares that story to help us understand. Every one of us goes through times just like that. And we look at them, and if we're not careful in our situation, wherever we plug our place, we begin to look at those places, and we try to start to somewhat have a place where we say, and people do this all the time, bargain with God. I will if you'll do this. We want to put our proverbial blanket out and see what's going to happen. And it's what he says, here's where I'm going to be if if this is where you will be. I I want to tell you this and and try this into this story from the life of Joseph. We we catch Joseph here at the very last days of his life. And and here's what I want you to know about Joseph. His whole life from very early on when he was born, uh, he was just a few years old when his mother had uh, his brother Benjamin And in childbirth, she passed. So all of a sudden, as a young man, he loses his mom. And then all of a sudden, God placed this dream in his heart, this belief in his heart. And and he gave him these dreams about what was going to be one day. And so he shares those dreams with his family. And now, I don't believe in my heart that he was just trying to be so overly arrogant with them. But basically, in the dreams, it was like they were one day going to bow down to him. And he told them these stories. And they just became enraged with that. Now, I want you to get this. His older brothers, all, all of them were older. It was 10 older brothers. They took him and they threw him 
in a whale, in a dry whale. And I believe they bound his hands and feet and lower him with a rope into the whale. And he lays in the whale. We don't know how long, but they were debating what to do with their brother. And he can hear them outside talking about, are we going to kill him? And then somebody has the idea, hey, we'll sell him to the Ishmaelites. We'll just sell him as a slave. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Here's a young guy who's 17 years old. And his brothers have dropped him into this pit. And he's laying in this pit, bound hand hand and foot. And he believes in his heart. He understands in his heart that God is going to do something with him in this world somehow, someday. That he's going to bring about something good. He's going to do something in this world that's impactful. But in the moment... He is laying in a pit, bound up, laying in the bottom, probably of a muddy spot, wondering how in the world did this happen to me? Why would my own brothers do something such as this to me? So they draw him up and they sell him. (laughs) The Ishmaelites take him to Egypt. And the next thing you know, they place him on an auction block and sell him as a slave. Potiphar buys him and takes him home. Now he's a slave. All of a sudden, this boy with promise is a slave in Egypt. And he does well. He does good. All of a sudden, things are working out for him. And then Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him. And and she then basically accuses him of trying to molest her. She tells Potiphar because she's mad. And the next thing you know, he's in prison. Two years. Two years. Can you imagine? Two years in prison for something you didn't do. And the whole time, I believe he's trusting God. He's saying, you know, he, he's believing, he's trusting. He's, he didn't cross that line for himself. But in the whole place of that, he's saying this, you know, oh, me, it's a so what kind of moment. I mean, you know, everything that's going on. And then we find ourselves in this prison. Finally, he interprets some dreams. He is told to Pharaoh that he can interpret dreams. And they pull him out. And then he tells Pharaoh, he said, listen, Pharaoh had had a dream about seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. The bottom line of it was this. There's going to be seven years of prosperity. And then there's going to be seven years of famine. And the famine is going to so wipe out the seven years of prosperity that you're not going to know. You're never even going to know you had the prosperity. And Pharaoh takes him in. And basically makes him the head over all of the agriculture, the growing. And and to get food to eat to last those seven years. All of this time, Joseph is down here in in Egypt all alone, separated from his daddy, separated from his family. And and all of a sudden, it gets really hard back home. Back home there in in, uh, the land of Canaan, they're starving. So the brothers show up to come and get there uh, to see if they can get some food. And when they come, all of a sudden, who do you think they get to see? They walk up. And he hears them speaking Hebrew. And he goes, hey, that's my brothers. He hears them. So anyway, the bottom line is he's going to give them the food they need to be able to live. But he also tells them, go get your little brother and your daddy and bring them back. So the bottom line of all this, there's going to be this reconciliation. But I want you to figure out where he's at in this moment. Try to feel a little bit of the so what's in Joseph's life. You know, I know this. There's nothing sometimes that can quite hurt you like the betrayal of family. Well, a family betrayal can be like the most hard thing in the world. And he's trying to live with that. He's got to live with that betrayal. He's got to know what to do with that. How is he going to process with that? In this story at the very end of Genesis, Jacob dies. His father dies. They bury him, and then all of a sudden, here's where this picture begins to unfold. Here's what I want you to see where Joseph is at. And here's what I'm going to tell you. This phrase, God meant it for good. And I want you to think about this today for you. I want you to hear, there's going to be a few things we're going to say in just a few minutes about God meant it for good. So what? Now what do you do with that? In this moment, it says there in verse 15 through about 19 that Joseph's brother, when they saw that their father died, they thought Joseph was going to turn on them. They thought because uh, that the daddy was gone, now they would turn on him and pay him back for all they had done. But Joseph said to them, he said, listen, I'm not in God's place. And here's what I want you to know. He forgave them a long time ago. He forgave them a long time ago. 
But here's what he's going to do in this moment that I want you to see in this place where there's a, there's a so what? My brothers have wronged me. Uh, my family has wronged me. They have hurt me. They've done something that is unexplainable and just totally uh, out of bounds. But here's what he's going to do. He's going to release all of his past to be in this moment. So his so what is in the midst of this hurt that he may feel. He's going to release that to be able to know what it means to live in this moment to let that past go. And that was important. That is important for us today. Here's what I think we need to grasp for us because most everybody along the way gets hurt. My dad and I talked about this a little bit in the last few days about situations and circumstances that happens in our lives. And we know about it's happened in churches over time where people get their feelings hurt. Somebody says something, somebody, and we carry this with us. Whether we realize it or not, we're carrying that with us. And we pray and we ask God for this. Oh, Jesus, this is the coolest thing to me. Joseph released them of their past before God a long time ago. But he released them for themselves in this moment. When they're afraid he's going to come and get them, he's going to say, look, he says to them, I'm not in God's place. I'm not your judge. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let you go. He demonstrated the greatest grace in that moment that you could ever see, that you could ever know. And we need to understand that and realize that every one of us to live in this moment and to live in this place and have this so what, now what kind of thing, we need to understand what it means is to release something from that past that is holding on to us, that's got a grip on us, that keeps us in our progress and our movement with God and helping who we can be in this moment. There's something holding on to us that... I'm going to tell you what, can hinder the work of God in our lives. I read this story and, and I ran across it again last night. And it just kind of, it, it's cool as ever to me about, about a story that, that kind of helps to understand that release of some things, to help some things happen. But I don't know if you've ever heard of, of the guy. And I'm going to have to look at his name because I won't say it just right. But it's Mitsua Fushada. Mitsua Fushada. He was the lead bomber. On December 7th, 1941, coming into Pearl Harbor. He was the commander of the team of guys that flew 860 planes into Pearl Harbor and bombed the place. Okay, if you fast forward just a little bit, and I know many people have watched the Pearl Harbor movie, so you know what Doolittle's raid is. There was a guy named Jacob DeSager, who was also a pilot, who flew a B-25 bomber over Japan to bomb Japan April 18th, 1941. His plane went down, and he was placed in a Japanese POW camp. And while he's in a POW camp, every day they were abused and mistreated. And someone was able to get to him a Bible. And he took that Bible, and he began Genesis, and he read the Revelation three times through that Bible. And he read that Bible, and he read that Bible. And in the midst of reading that Bible, he was saved. I mean, he was saved. You understand me? I don't mean he just got a little religion. I mean he got his heart changed. So all of a sudden he started changing the way he dealt with the prisoners or the, the people that was imprisoning him because when they would come to get him he would be nice to them. And he, he was speak kind of, he prayed for them and he let them know in his way that he was praying for them. And all of a sudden man his heart had a change. A few years later the war ended. He was set free. He come home to America, a changed man. Man, he flew into that war, one man. He come home, a saved man. And he was so saved, he just began telling everybody about his plight in a prison camp. He, 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 he wrote a pamphlet, and he would travel around and tell everybody what happened to him. And people were fascinated by his story. And, that. and all of a sudden, he said, I have to go back to Japan. He went to Japan as a missionary, <laughs> After they had been the ones to bomb him. Well, that's where the other fella, Fushada, gets involved. He hears of Deshazer. And he says, I've got to read the pamphlet. I want to know what he's going to talk about. He reads the pamphlet and says, I need to meet the man. These two men who had been the most arch enemies the world could have ever thought of, who would have hated each other and hated each other's country to the point of trying to kill each other, met. And Deshazer led him to salvation. Fushada gets saved. Get this. Then Fushada comes to America. 
and gets a green card and becomes an evangelist in the, on the west coast of the United States. And God begins to open doors and a lot of things began to happen in that world because two men was willing to release their past and open up their life to allow God to work in it in some kind of way. I, I believe that even in the body of Christ today, there's so many people that's just like wound up and tied about all these things that that's happened to them. And God in a moment just says, so what? Forget that. Get, let that go. I want to do something that's so far beyond that. If you will hang in there with me, I'm going to take you somewhere. And I want you to do this, Joey. Just let the past go. Just let that go. It don't matter anymore. And you're letting it hold you, bind you, keep you in, in some kind of a, 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 a bind here that squanders the work of God in your life. Here's what Joseph did. Joseph very simply put it there. I'm not your judge. I've forgiven you. It's clear. And here's the cool thing. I love this. He released them to go. He said, you go. It's go. You don't have that. I'm not holding that over you anymore. Man, that's a powerful place. That's a powerful thing for us to know. And know all that God meant this for good. So here's what he says in verse 20 and 21. He says, after Joseph has said, you know, don't be afraid. I'm not in God's place. And then here's what he said. As for you. And he acknowledges this. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And here's my thought in that. And remember this. God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And here's the whole thing. Just remember, get this in your brain. Understand this. And here's what Joseph believed. God's providence rules Remember the providence of God. Remember the working of God in all things. He is over all things. He is ruler of all things. It is no coincidence that this Shazer went down in Japan. It is no coincidence that he met that man and that man became a Christian and that man became evangelist. It was all the work of God. God is bringing about that. We look at world and we see all kind of things and we try to judge this situation versus that situation. And when you look at a particular situation isolated and all alone and something really bad happens, you go, how could that be good? Well, in and of itself, it's probably not good. But you put it together with the working of God, and you get in your mind, and you begin to live this kind of faith. You kind of believe this. Here, God meant it for good. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we face, no matter what trial, difficulty, struggle we may be in in a moment, here's the thing to know. I don't understand it. I may not even like it. God means it for good. I'm going to find that place. I want to know that place. I'm going to tell you what. Joseph knew that place. Joseph lived that place. Joseph's life was that. And because Joseph lived in that way, Joseph was able to see amazing things come to happen in and through his life because he understood this. Hey, you meant evil about it. I get it. You meant to harm me. But God meant that for good. Because God sowed down the road. He saw, he saw 20 years down the road. And he knew that this day was going to come. And I needed to be here to help preserve my family. And to bring that about. How different would we be if every time we get in such a tight. And when we get in such a jam and we feel like things are so hard, we didn't just pray, oh, Lord, fix it. Fix it now. Take this away. Fix this. And, and I wonder, because I, I was reading uh, Oswald Chambers this past week in his devotion, and in, in what he said in the devotion, he said, if God was human, we would just wear him out. Because we come to him with so much stuff all the time that many times it's so trivial in the scheme of things. And he said, we need to look at that. The Apostle Paul lived his life where he said, you know what? I glory in hardships. I glory in distresses. I glory in persecution. You know why? Because those things makes me better. <laughs> and they lock me in on the gospel like nothing else can. Wow. So what? Now what? What do we do? What do we do with where we are? Here's what I think Joseph says to me. Get this picture. God is in control. He's got, the, he's got it figured out. You're, you're in it, walk in it, and trust Him, even when you don't necessarily understand it. Do what He's got for you to do in it, and He's going to bring about something, ultimately, that's going to be amazing. Now, it, I'm not going to say it may be amazing just for you. You can go, oh, wait, this is awesome. 
It, it might not be in the shorter term of things. But in the scheme of God's plan and purpose. I never forget this statement. I was listening to Charles Stanley years ago. He's on the radio. And I've learned more from that man than anybody in the world. And I thought I would love to meet him because I'd like to say, man, you've meant so much to me. I, but anyway, here's what he said. He was in the hospital and he was sick. He was very sick. And his ministry had taken off and he's blasting the gospel into Russia back in the uh, early 80s. And, and it's amazing things happen. He gets sick. He's in the hospital. And in the midst of the hospital, a lady from his church comes to him. She lays hands on him and she's praying. You know, heal him, Lord. Heal him now. Get him out of this bed right now. And he says, in the midst of that, he says, I stopped her. And I said, man, you're not asking for God's will here. God is doing something greater in this moment with me laying in this hospital bed sick than if I was up well and going. And I just went, wow, I want some of that. I want to know that. I want to understand God in a different way like that so that, that, that my little bubble don't have to be good all the time and I judge God by how, based on how my bubble is. We need to grasp that, that in the scheme of things, the sovereignty of God, the, the providence of God, He is working and He's doing something that's amazing. Joseph saw it even when he didn't lock it in a pit, even when he didn't lock it in a prison, even when who knows if he locked it or not in a palace. In all of those places, he understood something. God's up to something greater than I may ever even know. But I'm going to trust him. Even in my so what moment anyway, I'm going to trust him. And that's the last part of this, 22 through 26. He stayed in Egypt with his father's household. And he lived 110 years. He got to see three generations. He got to see his grandkids and his great-grandkids. And then Joseph's brothers said to him, uh, when he said to them, I'm about to die. But get this, when he's about to die, I highlighted this this morning in orange in my Bible. I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you. Not Joseph. You know what? They kind of got the hang of Joseph, and they got the lock in what Joseph could do for them, didn't they? And they was worried about losing that. But he said, look, I'm going to go, but God is going to take care of you and bring you up from this land to which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you. He wanted them to say it. God will take care of you. Hear that. Believe that. And you'll carry my bones up from here when you go. Here's the thing. I want you to listen. He knows in, uh, back in ver chapter 46. This is really cool to me when I saw this this morning. Listen to verse, uh, chapter 46, verse 2, 3, and 4. God spoke to Israel in visions in the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. And I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. God had made a promise to Joseph's daddy. And to Joseph's granddaddy. And ultimately to Joseph. That I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. I will surely be with you and I'm going to bring you out from there and I'm going to take you to where I have for you to be. And here's my only thing I say about that is just trust. Trust in a moment when it's a so what moment and you just flat don't know what's happening. Trust that God made a promise. That God made a promise to bring salvation by grace through faith to your soul. That by the blood that Jesus said on the cross, he brought salvation to your soul. And you can know this. I am secure in the hands of God. He is with me. He's going to take care of me. He's going to see me through this. I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know what's going to come of it. Here's what I know. God made me a promise. He placed his spirit within me. And here's what I'm going to say. Trust him. Just trust him. Wherever you're at in this moment, just trust him. Just trust him. That's the now what? So what do I do? Trust him. I, I read this this week. And I want you just to hear this. It's been powerful to me. A football coach come up with this some few years back. And, and he just titled it, Hold the Rope. Have you ever heard that? Hold the Rope. 
And the bottom line is this is something that he taught his team. And so, man, when I got into that in the last uh, few days of reading that and thinking about that, that's kind of where I feel in this moment with, with our whole so what, now what kind of place. And here's what he said to them. He, he told his team, he said, whatever it is that's before you that you're supposed to do today, I want you to do that with all you got. Whether that's run, it's time to run. Whether it's time to work out, when it's time to practice, when it's time to play, I want you to get this in your mind. You're holding the rope. You're holding the rope for your teammates. You're holding the rope. So the guys blocking, uh, they had to learn their job. Hold the rope. The guy running has to carry the ball. And he says, hold the rope. So he's telling them the story about holding the rope. Then he cuts them all a little piece of rope, and they tie it on their keychain, and they carry it everywhere they go because he wants to picture them this, hold the rope. Here's why I feel God kept saying to me last night, Joey. Hold the rope. Hold the rope. Here's what that means to me in two different ways. First off is, he said, I got the other end. Hold the rope. Just hang on, man. Hold the rope. When it's hard, hold the rope. And here's what else he said to me. There's people around you that you're going to hold the rope for. And there's people around you who need you. And there's people around you who you need Hold the rope. And I could hear that. Hold the rope. And I, I thought about that. And I, I believe this. Huh, I believe this with all that I got. The staff at this church holds the rope for each other. They hold the rope. You can see it. You can feel it. You can know it. Sometimes things are difficult. Sometimes things are hard. But I can tell you, they will hold the rope for you. They hold the rope for me. I want to be able to hold a rope for you. Who is God going to put in your path? That he's going to say, in the midst of all the so what, you're going to hold a rope. You're going to hold a rope for somebody. You're going to hang on to them, and you're going to let them hang on to you, so you're going to help walk them through this. Here's something we want to try to do. We want to try to, to get three, four, five people together to create some smaller kind of community, two, three people, four people, and grow a relationship, study the Bible, and hold the rope. Hold a rope. Be a lifeline to each other. And when somebody's going down, hey, you just tell them, hold on the rope. I got you, buddy. Hold on. We need people who want to be able to be that for others. Be a Joseph for other people. Because I'm going to tell you what, if there's anywhere we should know this, if there's anywhere in the world one human being ought to know this whole concept, it's not on a football team, but is in God's house. God's house ought to be rope holders for each other. And to do that, that means there's connection that goes on. There's life that goes on. And when one is slipping away, the other one knows it. And you know how to reach there and hold them. I'm going to tell you something. I think Joseph is an awesome picture to me. Somebody who just said, hey, I'm going to let all that junk go. I'm just going to let that junk go. And I'm going to trust today. I'm going to trust in the providence of God. I don't understand it. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how it's going to work. But I believe that God does, and I'm just going to hold on to that. And in the midst of that, I'm going to have this place where I just trust that he's going to hold on to me as I help hold on to someone else. And God is going to bring connection and he's going to bring a work in and through his church. There's going to be a powerful movement of God. But it starts in little groups, little connections of people who's willing to say, who's willing to say, I'll hold the rope. I'll hold the rope. Will you hold the rope? I want to hold the rope. I I want to be as Joseph. Joseph, a man of faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you.